Um, let me start off by asking you guys a few quick questions. Um, you obviously have read my abstract, so you kind of have a sense of what I'm going to talk about. I'll introduce myself along the way with, with some of the slides. You'll understand a little bit more about the world I live and work in. But I thought it would be great to start off with getting a quick sense of everybody in the room um, with the first question, at least. Um, this one we'll do by a quick survey of raising hands. Um, where do you consider yourself with respect to this notion of um, building or having to deliver S-bombs within your organization? And when I say crawl, walk, and run, I mean crawl would be you're just getting started. You're kind of still doing the homework. You haven't really produced anything yet from an S-bomb perspective. You're, um, walking would be um, you've been forced to deliver one or two, maybe kind of an ad hoc process. And running would be you're doing it on a regular basis, right, consistently with each release. So if I said, all those who are at the crawl state, can you raise your hand? OK, about a third. How many people are at the walking state? OK. And how many people are running? OK, great. It's about equal. The next question I'm going to ask, and you can just volunteer if you want, for those, particularly those who are walking and running, um, but anybody, what are some of the things that keep you up at night with respect to this activity? What concerns you most? So anyone want to give a shot at that? They want more than just licensing. Go on, OK, more detail, more granular, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have this. No, no, no. We have, we have that challenge. Yes. So she's, yeah, she's, she, in case you couldn't hear her, she, she said that, you know, in case that vulnerability comes out, that newsflash, right, that there's a vulnerability in a particular component, you want to be able to find it within all your products that would potentially have that component. That's what's keeping you up at night at sometimes, yes. Right? Been there? Been in that drill before where I had to scramble and figure out where, which pro pro products are affected? Anybody else want to offer up uh, something that keeps them up at night? Yeah. Sure. I, I think that's a very valid point. There, I'll be very honest with you. I've been doing this for more than 10 years. We've been producing these things for more than 10 years. I'll talk about that a little bit. But there's not a lot of people out there consuming them. And I think that's valid. Why are we all spending so much time worrying about it, right? And we have delivered it in the earlier stages. And I'll, I'll, get, I'll talk about that next. So one of the things that um, I like to draw is this analogy. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the famous elephant parable, but it's basically where you have six blind people get introduced to an elephant, they've never, and they touch some part of it. They're all touching the same thing, right? But they all come to a different conclusion. It means different things to different people, right? So I like to refer to the uh, S-bomb parable. And within our own organization, different people have different thoughts about what an S-bomb should be, right? Um, and I literally, I have six different teams having a different interpretation of what it should have in it. Obviously, some are going to deal with licensing. Some are going to want security data, vulnerability data, right? And uh, we've even had to deal with export, and I'll talk about that in a second. What keeps me up at night, having done this for 10 years, is these key um, factors. First, we really, really want to make sure we have an accurate and complete list. That's always a challenge, right? That's what we mean by quality. What we mean by flexibility is, a number of things, right? Obviously, the metadata, like dealing with licensing versus security versus export versus dependencies and build information, OK? And then um, also, we have different product lines. We have some that we have a cloud-based solution, right? And we also have um, a, a, an operating system for device IoT devices. And a very different kind of software, yet we need to produce an SBOM for each one of those. I need flexibility in how to do that, too. Scalability, we're dealing with, we're consuming tens of thousands um, of components a year, and, and we're processing to produce S-bombs. And I'll, I'll get into that in more detail. So a little bit more about the history where I'm coming from. About 2009, 2010, 
my, my, the company I work for, we do into, um, IoT operating system device for devices. And that was the first space where people became very paranoid about the inclusion of G GPL licensed software in their products, right? Today, it's a lot less of a concern, but it's still a concern. And, but back then, everybody was freaking out. Do you, you, know, you buy our product, do you have GPL in there, right? Can you give us the list? And they would put it into the contracts. Give us a list of all the open source you have and their respective licenses. So SPDX came out around that time. I contributed to that initiative. And we were the first ones to produce SPDX data for a Linux distro. We offer a commercial grade Linux. Actually, we have several commercial grade Linux um, solutions. Actually, one of them is actually running Verizon's 5G network. So these are serious um, you know, systems. And uh, we basically had to make sure we had all the licensing information, much of what Ross was referring to, even today. Um, we also ended up having to deal with export. I don't know if a lot of people really care about that here, but a lot of companies have to do export compliance. And that's really, before you ship your code outside the US, or whatever country you're in, your, your country will have respective um, export compliance issues. You have to comply with the crypto guidelines around that software. We messed up a little bit. We self-reported ourselves to the government, and they were kind, and they only um, fined us $750,000. So um, if they had caught us, um, like we didn't self-disclose, uh, uh, report ourselves, it would have been a lot worse. But we had to go through all the open source in our products to find out, make sure we got those crypto right. I'll be frank with you, I don't think many companies really pay a lot of attention to this part, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a thing you gotta do, okay? All right, moving on. Obviously today, a lot of people are talking about security and build, and that's what's driving the SBOM initiatives, mostly. It's licensing for sure, and I, I'm seeing a, a, an increase in the amount of um, need for licensing um, SBOMs I don't know how many people are familiar with um, the changing of licenses of different open source projects. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's a lot of job security for us guys in the SBOM world, right? Also because like Vault, um, HashiCorp Vault just changed their license. And um, you need to know when they change their license, which one of your products are currently using it. Even if it's the older, license, the older version with the better license, the nicer license, you know you're going to upgrade at some point, right? So. That's you know, a big deal. Um, I'm not gonna speak a lot about this, but functional safety is a, a, a growing um, space where you have autonomous driving vehicles and you have to certify that your software is functionally safe to run. You have to go through all the components in your product to verify that you're actually doing that correctly. I believe that's the next frontier for driving the need for SBOMs, okay? Um, but anyway, there's another way of looking at it. This first way was really largely looking at um, from a task perspective, I'm sorry, yeah, from a task perspective. The second timeline is more about how I also saw it from a evolving component world. So um, back in the day, um, we used to grab stuff off the internet, and if you grabbed a binary, you had a requirement that you had to build the source, or grab the source so you could build it in case you had bugs, right? And so um, we looked at a component as a simply a binary an application. Obviously, Linux came along and lots of packages out there, and all of a sudden now we're looking at building materials with lots of packages in it. And then um, in our world, um, you can have a single line item now where Linux runtime is one of the components which you can then drill down on. Clearly we have containers and that's a big deal now. You know, your, your software components could be a bunch of containers, right? And you want to be able to have a list of containers and then click on one and drill down from there. What I'm trying to emphasize here is that the world is evolving on what exactly is a software component. What exactly is the things you're gonna list out in your bomb, okay? All right. So here's one of the first things I wanted to emphasize that I've learned, and I think a lot of people do this incorrectly. They often will choose a tool to solve their problem, and sometimes that might be enough because you just have a basic need. Then they'll build their process around the tool, whatever the tool will allow them to do, and then they can do whatever um, that, that tool allows them to do. This is, in our eyes, from our experience, backwards. But this is commonly how people do that. So you might, anybody here use like Black Duck? Okay, we use Black Duck too. I used to work, we used to be owned by another company, a very large company. They built their whole uh, compliance program or, you know, around that. 
And at some point, they got into a, a sticky, tough situation because they could only do what the tool allowed them to do, right? So what I'm emphasizing here is this, the opposite, right? You, you really want to start out with the requirements from which you want to support. I'm going to talk about these and what we do here, OK? Then you want to define a process. Then you want to deal with the tooling and select tooling. This is really important. If you walk away with just one thing, this is the one thing I would love to tell you to walk away with. And when I say process, I think designing the process is as important as tooling, if not more. OK? And that's a struggle we all have. We all need to get our developers to behave a certain way when you have a process. It's not trivial, right? And so um, I'm going to talk about that. So not surprising, this is going to be the agenda for the talk. We're going to talk about the, how we deal with our experience with requirements, how that took us into process, and how that took us into tooling. OK? All right. From the most basic definition, you know, one of the key things we want to highlight is an SBOM is just a list of components, right? And those components could be well, only open source, or they can be some combination of open source and third-party commercial. Or I'm starting to hear, you know, you got to include your proprietary pieces in that list as well, right? It's not as common. It definitely started out with open source. Still many people are asking for their open source. Most of the contracts we enter into with our big customers are asking for the list of all the open source, and you, you, along with licensing, for example. Clearly, they also want to understand when there's security vulnerabilities, they want to understand that. It's all about the open source, well-known vulnerabilities, because that's what's tracked by the industry. So we know it's, you know, our requirements, it's a basic list that can support any combination of those. And second, it's a list that both we, the, um, when doing our own compliance work, and our customers can trust. Okay, and what I mean by that is, have we produced all the components? Have we gathered up all the dependencies? Okay? to perform these various tasks. And we also deal with a number of government regulations, so this is what we need to think about. Now, everybody's very familiar with how software is today. I like to highlight this for, so we can discuss it in a certain way. Whether you're dealing with an application, a library, a container, or an entire device runtime, they all have this basic composition, right? It's largely open source, and you know what? You're at a competitive disadvantage if you don't take this approach. You're gonna start writing all that stuff? Good luck, right? This is just the way it is, right? And you know, we understand that. But then you know, along comes containers, and all of a sudden you deal with products that are collections of containers. And the problem just blows up, OK? OK. And I realize you guys know this. I'm just trying to give us some vocabulary so we can discuss other things. The other thing that we really want to do, and we've seen over time, over those 10 years, is what exactly is a software component? Right? I told you in the beginning it was a binary that you grabbed off the internet, then it became packages. We mostly deal with packages as your bill of materials, I would guess. We are starting to have to deliver those to containers along with the, and then drill down on the packages. Okay? So I wanted to draw an analogy how I look at I, I like to think of them not so much as what's the ingredients in my software, but what are the parts, right? So I'm gonna draw this analogy is that we wanted to build a data model that we can have a bunch of items in our bill of materials in our list. And they can be any one of these. They can be a library, a file library, an application or, or package, and, or it can be an entire Linux runtime. For example, you grab a container. One of the layers is Alpine, right? You want to say, there's a bill of materials for that. You don't want to have to say, list out all the packages for Alpine right away, but you want to say Alpine. That's a, that could be a component, OK? And so um, we want to treat that as a first class citizen in terms of a component that you can drill down on. And not surprisingly, containers as well and then an entire product as well. An entire product can be a single line item in our bill of materials because we ship products that are a collection of other products. Like we have a hypervisor that runs on an automotive, uh, on a car, right? You can have multiple operating systems running in that car and you have to have like a two, um, like you have VxWorks, which is one of our operating systems, and Linux. So we're gonna bundle that as an entire product, which is a collection of three other products. So they're all potentially line items. Okay, so this is what's important to us as well. And the other thing is, I told you, we have a variety of different products. I don't know, sometimes companies deal with just one type. Well, our first main type is um, what I would say our operating systems. They're, they're the um, nervous systems of our customers' products. Our products run mo a lot of the satellites that orbit the Milky Way galaxy or the Mars rovers or the um, Webb telescope. Um, elevators, and, and, and like I mentioned, cars. 
But we also have products that could be just your basic application, an SDK, right? We have one major product that's also a cloud solution, okay? And that's the product that's comp comprised of over 200 containers, okay? And then, you know, we have, you know, like I mentioned, you can have a, 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 a suite of things. And each of these can have to have a bill of materials. And again, this is where we need flexibility. Each team is gonna want to construct a, um, their bill of materials um, differently. Now, different companies will potentially have maybe just one of these and they'll just take one path, okay. So the other thing that's really important to us was um, building it, um, having a, a bill of materials available in real time. So as soon as the developer discloses something, it instantly appears and you can see it. You don't have to wait to the end to generate a report, right? So you have, it's alive, it's a, it's a live document that you can get at any time, okay? I'm not gonna go through this, this is what I just went through. This is a quick one pager summary of all the requirements we just went over, okay? And you know, I think there's one other thing to highlight is that what is also true is exactly what is an SBOM is evolving as, as, we, as we go, okay? So we have to be mindful of that. All right, so I kind of gave you some of the requirements that we have put in place that we need to address. Next, I want to talk about the process we have. Now, keep in mind, everybody's going to have a different process, right? They're going to be dictated by your requirements, okay? So this is just what we do. You obviously, I'm not saying this is what you should be doing. I'm just saying this is the process we came up with based on our requirements, okay? And, um, you know, but the key is to have the process well-defined, all right? And then I'll share what we've learned from having this process. So the first thing we're going to do is require each engineer engineering team to detect and disclose the use of each component in their product. Now, there are lots of ways they can do that. There's a lot of automation you can do. I remember I mentioned that we have all these different kinds of products. They have different kinds of development pipelines. So I can't go in and say, oh, this is one way of doing this. Each team gets to decide. What they have to do, though, is detect it and then submit it to our server, which is going to standardize on a, a certain disclosure record. Right, that all teams have to map their data into, right? Um, and a disclosure record, um, well, and what happens is as they're disclosing them in real time, we're, we're building up that bomb, okay? And a disclosure record looks something like this. The, the first set of information is what I call intrinsic data. Things are just naturally um, attributes of the component itself, the name, the version, the license, the actual content, right? But then you have its use. And I'm gonna highlight that this separation is important. The use is how it's used within a given release, right? So, it, you know, not only where it's located, but whether it was modified, whether it was linked, whether it was distributed as binary source, okay? So, yes. What we do is we allow, every, she's asking how can they define the location? Let me say, before I answer that question, what we care about is if they're using three different instances of ZLib, we expect them to give us three disclosures within that product and tell us where it is in the product. Now, they get to decide on how they want to structure their product. They can, it's, it's just a hierarchy, a name, like for example, if they were using Linux, Linux, you can divide it up into user space and kernel space, and that's it. That's as simple as you can make it. And you might assign the disclosure to user space or you might assign it, assign it to kernel space. That's just up to them to decide how to structure it. There's no rules about how to structure it. We just give them the ability to give a structure. So another way of thinking about it is they can also set it to, oh, I wanna say in, if I say kernel space, I also wanna say it's user space, kernel space, but if it's in kernel space, you have to tell me if it's networking, me me memory management, you know. So they get to define that. That's, they have to, but we wanna know that when we're looking at a product, we want to be able to have this high-level tree that we can drill down and see where the components are. We don't want a flat list. You could make it a fat, flat list. You could ignore this requirement, just say everything's at the top level. We give you the ability to, to identify a location within. Okay? All right. Um, so then this information is going to go off, right? And then it's going to go over to the team that has to deal with all the analysis. Um, and this is where we're actually digging in and looking at what we call the intrinsic information about the component, the, the um, inherent n um, nature of it, whether it's licensing. It's not the use of it. It's not how it's used. It's, 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 it's core information, okay? And then we have a process where um, that there's, we have people assigned that actually review 
are um, the releases, and they go through systematically, and they look at that bill of materials, and they check for a variety of different things, like does it meet the policy, and so forth. Um, and so uh, the, the key here is that that person also may need to engage with um, different departments within our company. So for example, obviously they have a legal problem, they're gonna deal with legal. If there's a royalty with respect to a third party component, commercial component, they have to deal with them and so forth. Then what's gonna happen is they're gonna prepare all the compliance artifacts based on going through each item in the bill of materials, gather up all those, um, all those you know, um, artifacts and create a bundle and give it to other customer, okay? And if I click on this, I'm gonna show you, and this is live on our website. This is a particular product, in fact, Lisa Seneva just joined us from the back. She works on this product, and she's the one who prepared these reports. So, um, so basically, this is um, you know what we're gonna, every release is going to get their own set of artifacts, right? Here's the notice file. Okay. All right. So, um, here's the source code, right? Here's the bill of materials. Okay. This is for a version of Linux that we have. You can even look at the SPDX data if you wanted to. And this is just one file, SPX file for it. This is, we, we just came up with this format, but I just wanted to point out that this is just one way of delivering that data. We also give out the SPX data, the raw data, if they want to import that into their own system. And then finally, we give out a you know, statement saying that this was done under an open chain conforming process. For those who are familiar with open chain, you will understand that's all about having a process, okay? How many people here are familiar with what open chain is? So obviously, if you're open chain conforming, you got to have a process. That's a requirement of it. That's at the core. So this is what we do to, to highlight that we not only have a process, but it's certified. OK? All right. So all right. Um, so one emphasis I want to point out here is this is the one touch point we have with our engineers. I told you, they have to re identify and report, right? They're the best ones to do it. We're going to work with them, help them. Hopefully, they have the best tools. They're going to write tools to do that. But they don't have to worry about any other part of this process. And we're going to talk more about this. I don't know if you're familiar with the term shifting left, trying to get things done sooner in the cycle. We're set up so that you could be as far left as you need to be. If you're just starting a new product and you want to start disclosing to us some of the, com like maybe all of a sudden you're going to use HashiCorp vaults and you realize that there might be some concerns that you might want to submit it to our team, you can start submitting it immediately. You don't have to wait till some code to scan, right? But once you have some code to scan, you could also run tools on that to detect stuff and also submit that to our server. But the key point here is the developer doesn't have to worry about the rest of this process. You know, they just want to do their job, right? And that when, if we change anything, then they're not as impacted. And I'll talk more about that when we get to tooling. Um, you can see that the number of disclosures that we're receiving from our engineering teams is growing. And in fact, last year, we had over 120,000 disclosures submitted to our team. Okay? And I definitely believe we're on track to break that record this year. Okay. All right. We talked about requirements. We talked about process. Now we get to talk about tooling, which everybody likes to talk about, right? But now we can talk about it because we know where, what kind of tooling we will need. And sometimes we're gonna to have to either develop it and or hopefully find it in open source or possibly also have to purchase it. Now, I just put up a brief list of things that we are monitor and look at. Um, and I broke this out into two sets of, um, of tooling. The first one is these systems that are end-to-end -end enterprise solutions that help you monitor all your open source and build, um, export out uh, build materials as well as a second set of tooling that's really about helping you do forensics analysis on your source code and determine what's there. And, um, you know, and just, you could, you know, if you want to take a photo of this, I'm not going to go through this list at any length due to time, but these are the things we're tracking and we're finding a lot of value in this. I'm going to talk about some of these tools in our, in our actual um, process, how we, which ones we're using. Okay. So I just want to give you a sense that there's a lot out there to, to help you support your process, whatever process you come up with, okay? As I mentioned, I just gave them some labels to say that we're gonna talk about each of these areas and which tooling we chose, okay? So this is, I'm gonna really, I'm gonna give you a little bit more details about the back end system we have. 
So I mentioned on the left side, all the teams are submitting to the central server, right? It's simply um, a REST API, and they're just sending us you know, these JSON records of basic information as they detect it, and they're submitting it. And what's going to happen is, um, and as I mentioned earlier, we talked about this, the information they're sending us, that's the information coming over, and it's standardized across all teams, right? Every single team sends us the same exact kind of record. Um, and then what's going to happen is it's going to go off into two different directions. We have a forensic analysis um, team and, and tooling, and that's going to do all kinds of analysis. And the important part there is, like, for example, we we'll run scan code on it. We used to run fossology on it. Um, you can run turn on it. Right? You can do all kinds of tools that we just highlighted. And the good thing is if we ever come up with a new tool, we can actually go ahead and you know, just run it there, add it to that mix. In fact, you know, we've even played around with chat GPT. You know, just you can plug it in. And so when a package comes in, you can just go down the list and run different analysis tools on it. The thing I really want to highlight is the real secret sauce here is the catalog. Okay, and the catalog is something I talked about last year, which we open sourced. Okay, and I'm going to talk. What the catalog simply is is a list of all that components that your organization has used. You ever buy a piece of furniture and you have to assemble it and you have to pull out the bill of materials and it tells you this type of screw, you have four of them, and, and this kind of, um, you know, the leg of the chairs, you have another four of those, or maybe eight of the screws, but you, the screws listed once, right? And how many of you have of it? Well, the catalog is going to list each item once. That's what it does. It stores all the intrinsic data about that one component. For example, again, back to ZLib. Someone who uses ZLib in their product, or in this case, we're talking about BusyBox. It comes in, it says, all right, oh, we already know about BusyBox. We don't have to do any more analysis on it. Or, no, wait a second, that's the first time we saw BusyBox. Let's run a bunch of analysis on it and populate the database with all its um, intrinsic data. Okay? It's stored in one place. Okay? And then, um, if we want to get another tool comes out, we can run it on those components and populate the data even more. So the central place for the core intrinsic data. Then what happens is it goes up to our, in this case, we have a homegrown bomb manager. And I'm going to talk about how we use other managers as well. So basically, what's going to happen is, remember I told you this is a description of use? So this is just a list manager, essentially, right? So I'll click on it. I'll bring it up. This is our internal solution. And I'm going to click on this, this particular release. Um, sorry, demo release. And you'll see that you, know, you have a bunch of components, and here's BusyBox, right? And I can click on BusyBox, and then it's going to come up with the disclosure record. Remember I told you to disclose all this, whether they modified, whether they um, linked. And then I can click on the actual catalog entry. So I jump right to the catalog, and I'm looking at, oh, I have this information about its license analysis, its scan code, um, security analysis, and quality analysis. And we could add more over time, OK? I know there's a lot going on here, but the catalog is just simply the place where you have each component that ever entered your organization entered once, and all the information about that component. And if you learn more about it over time, you put it in there. And that the, the bomb manager system will just inherit that data because it points to the record. Okay? Okay. Um, now, remember I told you this information comes in and goes off to this one? Well, we've also done something where we can add other tools into it. Okay? The same record of information we can program to the Black Duck API. And, we, and, and in fact, if I go ahead and I click on here, up comes Black Duck, and guess what? The same components are there, including BusyBox. I can click on BusyBox, and you, you can drill down in that, in that tool. So the key point here is you can put in any number of tools. Again, this is what we're designing. Remember I said flexibility is one of those important things? It might turn out that over time, Black Duck no longer serves our needs, but all of a sudden, another tool does. Or maybe Black Duck is really good with security vulnerability, but another tool is good with... Um, let's say, export cryptography you know, um, analysis. The good news is our analysts can actually look at multiple tools to see and, and inspect that review from different angles. So our goal was, and I don't even know what tools are going to come out down the road. Remember I showed you the, whole, the two sets of um, tooling? Well, that whole top set could all each have their own entry here. So they're all getting the same disclosure, right? They're all getting the same information. Now, what happens if we add another one six months later, but that release was obviously shipped six months prior? 
we could replay all those disclosures and we can repopulate that new tool with all the disclosures and get all that analysis. We don't have to tell the developers, oh, redisclose it. I, I know I'm getting a little elaborate here. This can be quite sophisticated. But our goal was to build a very modular um, system where you can either plug in, in um, new tools down below for analysis that populate our database, or you can plug in any other um, third-party tool as long as they have a proper API. Okay? So ultimately, out will come an S-bomb. It can come out from Black Duck. It can come out from our bomb manager. Um, but the other thing to understand is because this database is being constructed along the way, and again, it's every single component that ever entered our organization, right? Third party, commercial, or open source is in the catalog. All of a sudden, you might want to start writing your own set of tools. And this thing is easy to query because it's in GraphQL, right? So even though it's, it has its, it's very autonomous, it's its own thing, so you can come up and write tools as, as, and you're not dependent on our whole back end system. You don't even have to worry about how that all works. You just have to know that system exists and this is the, the central repository of all that information, okay? I don't want to spend a lot of time, I was kind of highlighting the difference between the catalog, which is again, it's intrinsic data. That means release independent data. Data that's inherently natural about the component. Whereas the, the bomb manager, the list manager, if you want to call them, all those tools, they're really you know, maintaining the lists, the, like the different lists, and certain attributes of how it's used, okay? This is something we have definitely learned over time. It's become really important to make a distinction between that data, and by having this parts catalog has enabled us to create that separation in a clean way, okay? Now, just so you know, we would be happy to open source even more of our systems. I, I mentioned the catalog is currently available. We would love to consider opening up some of these other pieces where you can, you know, people can take this harness um, and just get their engineers to you know, plug in through a standard you know, way of disclosing, and then you could have that ability to broadcast to whatever tools you want, or to add in any forensics analysis tools you want, and then have that populate your catalog. Now, if anybody takes the catalog, keep in mind, it's just going to be a catalog of all your stuff that's internal to your organization. Okay? We're, we're, we're not yet open sourcing these pieces yet. We're out there trying to find others who are interested to contribute because it's just, it's a big initiative to come out and just, it's not like a single tool. But if there are other people out there that are interested in participating, we'd be interested in offering it up and working with them to put these out there for other people to use through an open source initiative. Okay. I promised you guys I would do some do's and don'ts, okay? Real quick, you know, this is just really largely a summary. Um, you know, again, I always highlight, you know, it, it's really about starting with the requirements, then the process, and then the tooling. Not starting with tooling, because that'll just lock you in. By the way, our system is really good about preventing vendor lock-in. What happens if you lost your license to Black Duck? All of a sudden, you lose all your data. But if you pump that data into the catalog, and you unplug it, and you plug something else in, you don't lose it, right? Okay. Um, you will likely need to choose between um, quality and velocity. <laughs> I don't know how many people have ever heard that um, adage where it says, you could have it either be good, fast, or cheap. Pick two. I don't know if you ever heard that. Basically, you're bounded by um, only two of those because if you take, choose the other, you can't do it. So you all have budgets. Typically, if you want, you may decide that velocity is more important than the quality. That's fine. You'll design your process around velocity. That's a choice. There's nothing wrong with that choice. Your organization makes that choice. But you typically have to make one versus the other. If you're going to try to do both, you're going to pay. It's going to be very expensive. That's, what, that's the main point. Um, oh, yeah, don't assume that because someone's automated something, it's going to be good. <laughs> I mean, you can automate, but it takes a lot of effort to make a good quality automation. Um, Companies love to say, are you automating that yet? Um, don't assume um, a tool fits all, um, one tool fits all. Um, I told you we have all these different kinds of products. Um, you know, commit to, trust, and, and evolve your process. Your, your process is ongoing, it's evolution. It's not just one time shot, right? But we can evolve our process largely without impacting our engineer, engineers too much. Find what a component it is. It may be just a package, right? Um, but that's fine. We just, obviously we built the catalog so we can represent all those different kinds of parts. Whether it's a file, it's a, um, a container, an entire length of runtime. It can model all those in the same catalog. 
I already highlighted this fact that you, know, you want to try whenever possible, if you're going to build out a system, um, keep the separation. By the way, these third-party commercial tools all do it. They all have knowledge bases, right? They do the separation already. It's not, you know. Um, and then finally, um, we, it's really important to give the responsibility to your developers to, to detect things and to report them, but give them the autonomy to do it their way. OK? Um, and that's how we create that separation so that they can do it their way, but yet they have to map it into a standard record format, which is the next point. Okay? And plan for the SBOM requirements that we're all dealing with to evolve over time anyway. Okay? All right. Again, just to highlight, now you understand what I meant by quality. We want an accurate and complete list. The flexibility is all built into our system. And again, it's scalable. We, you're seeing we're at 120,000. Um, we just had a product ship. It had 40,000 disclosures in one release alone. OK, we're right now at the question section. And if you ever want to talk about collaborating, um, reach out to me. Any questions? Yes? So you mentioned it isn't, a, it isn't enough to say this open library as a service. Is that because you're basically doing containers and containers and contain containers? And if so, does that mean that you would be able to define That's right. You can, first of all, first of all, you, you were asking about the name and version first. Okay. People name the same thing, use the same name and version in the file name, but yet they could be off by a few files. If it's off by one file difference, we consider them two different things, first of all. When it comes to a container, yes, it's very easy to disclose a container. And by the way, this is common in our, in our world, you know, universal base containers. We want to use that one base container across our, all, uh, um, a bunch of our containers, right? So they can disclose it once, the container itself. And then they can disclose the list of all the things that are in that container by assigning those packages to that container. And then they just get a single ID. They can refer to it as a single line item everywhere else. And that was what we did. We built a catalog. To, we built a data model to enable that. That's why I spent so much time talking about the different ways of looking at what a software part might be. Most of us are dealing with packages, right? and you know, well-known vulnerabilities. We felt that we needed to plan for the future a little bit. Um, you know, the old corny, well, it's commonly referred to, I don't know, Wayne Gretzky's quote, I don't go to where the puck was, and we go to where the, the puck is going to be. I don't know if you ever heard that one. Well, we're trying to skate to where the puck is going to be, so to speak, yeah. Other questions? Yes. He has a, here's a mic for you. Yeah, I, I, you talked about the catalog, but um, when it comes to granularity, um, how do you know you have reached the optimal granularity when it comes to defining your component? There, there is, there's no rule of, uh, gra you get to decide at any given product how you want to granulize things. We don't, we just want to be able to support it. If you choose the granulize, it, it, there's a lot of freedom there. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. There's no ultimate rule of thumb. But if they want to break out their, if they want to list their, if you had three containers, and one container had 100 things, and the next container had 200 things, the next one had 300 things, and you just want to list them all as one flat list and not even list out the containers, they can do that. They can, but they also can say, no, I want to define this container. I want to see these 100 this, 200 the other one, 300, and I want to list it that way. That's the beauty of it. You get to decide. Sometimes you have too much flexibility. It can be a problem, right? right. But so we, we don't. We don't, we don't have a rule of thumb there. OK. Uh, Follow-up question. Uh, so generally, a, the SBOM of a, a component is fine a, 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 in, its, in isolation. That's right. But when you put them together, the weakest right. link is what determines the overall risk. Sure. Right? So do you have any recommendations on uh, how you calculated that sort of risk? Or are there any tools or frameworks that help you assist risk collection? It's a great question. It's well beyond the scope of this talk in the sense that I have no problems with it. It's, it's just a really open-ended kind of discussion. Um, we have teams, and they have security people, and they come and do an assessment. It would be no different than. So what, you want, what, what I, what I want to do, I want to prepare the accurate and complete list so you can drill down to know that you have that component and therefore, you have a problem to your question earlier, right? You, you were, what keeps you up at night? You said, somebody finds a vulnerability, the weakest link piece, 
and you want to know where it is. And do you have that problem, right? That's our, we're focused on just doing that here. That allows those other people, the other team, to come in and drill down immediately to where it is and let them make an assessment based on that situation. It's use. It's use. Now, keep in mind, I told you, Vault, HashiCorp Vault has this new license. They changed it on. I think, what was it, MPL initially? MPL? And they changed it to this business license, which says, part of it says something to the effect like, if you use this component in, in, in a way that competes with us, you have to use the business license. You have to get a, a license. But if you don't compete with them, is, is that right, Lisa? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, so to the point, if we have a bill of materials and you know HashiCorp is in three different parts of your product, and keep in mind, we have a product with 200 containers, and believe me, it was in more than one place. We now have to ask ourselves, in this look, particular use, are we competing with them? In this one, are we competing with them? And in this one, our team is only concerned about reporting what is, telling you, giving you that immediate context of how it's used. And I'm going to let everybody else worry about the other problems. <laughs> but it's a great question. I mean, I, it's, I think it's a whole other talk. Yes? Um, so talking about risk and uh, security vulnerabilities, um, I, I just wonder if the... Um, the, the catalog uh, might lull people into a sense of complacency uh, because it's insufficient to know what version of a given package you're using. You also need to know how it was built, like which, with, with which configure flags, um, which architecture you're using, because otherwise you have no idea whether you are impacted by a particular vulnerability. So, so I'm just wondering whether it is, you know, uh, required in the catalog that you uh, include this extra information um, because I, I just worry that its usefulness yeah. will be quite limited. It's a great question, and um, that's why we built a, a data model that represents multiple. So if you build a binary that happened to use that other component that has the vulnerability, the binary could have build information and a compiler used, whatever you want, because the binary is, is, is another part. So yes, let's say, say BusyBox was the one, and you can configure BusyBox to be built a certain way, and it may include the vulnerability, it may not include the vulnerability, right? So I might have a Linux runtime that uses BusyBox. Now your question is, did it really pull in that set of files that has the problem, right? Well, you can publish not only BusyBox and you know, have that information in it, but you also can publish the Linux runtime binary into the catalog and include all that information with that binary. And you're more interested in that binary because that's the thing that's shipping. So yes, the catalog has been designed to be able to mon uh, manage that information, it's just that you have to be able to put it in there, right? Someone has to put it in there. But we, ha we enable you to put it in there. Whether you do or not is a different thing. And I guess also, do you have uh, like instructions for installing uh, onto a device as well? Because I mean, a lot of uh, so, licenses yeah. have that requirement as well. So we do not yet have that information stored in the catalog, but the catalog's designed so you could add new profiles over time. So you're talking about a new profile, like a little schema, right, of information, a, a packet of information. Remember, I, I don't know if you were here, but I showed the catalog. It had security, it had quality, it had um, licensing. Those are, and now all of a sudden you want to have build information. We, you can add that to an existing catalog component, creating a JSON record, and it gets assigned to it based on the information you put in. So the catalog allows you to store that information any part that's there, because it'll, it's a combination of SQL and, and non-SQL. Um, non it has documents. So you can store that information. I think the answer Okay, you, you said build information. Just to confirm, you could also include install information. In you there. create a new profile for install only. Yes. Okay. In fact, I was just talking to the people with Salsa and Guac and um, all the stuff they're doing. Uh, you know, Salsa, I don't know if you're familiar with Salsa. Yeah. It's really great stuff. We can store Salsa information in the database. That's the goal, to build a data model that's highly extendable. And maybe we have to evolve that data model over time. That's the objective. Yeah. Yeah, he, yeah, well, yeah. and to your point, yeah, to the point is like, if you ever have new data, we, it's just a JSON record. We designed it so you can add on all these different ones. Yes. It's a good point, and it's something we have to think about. We want that flex. That's what I mean by flexibility. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm I'm come from the uh, 
background of AI safety regulations. So I'd like, like to hear uh, more of your thought on those like functional safety. For example, uh, it's, it's, not, it's uh, in the draft EU AI Act, they're talking about, uh, for example, EU declaration of conformity, which is like, there's, there's a lot of requirement and obligation, including certifications. And they say that right. if you actually made a substanti substantial uh, change in your AI system, you actually need a recertification. So I just wonder like how this S bomb can help you on that. Yeah. Thanks. So you're talking about functionally safety aspects. Yes, function, please. right? Okay. It just happens to be an AI application. Right, right, doesn't matter, right? So let's talk about the self-driving car that has AI, a lot of AI in it. But what you can do is because you have the list, if the list is accurate and complete, you can then add, cert um, if you certify, then you go down and say, is this one certified? Is this one certified? Is this one certified? You have a systematic way of doing that. What, I don't know if you're familiar, uh, people here, in case you're not familiar with fun functionally safe software, basically any software that can maim or kill somebody, you, you might have to get it certified to be functionally safe. It's a certification, okay? So, you know, you know if you're building the software, you have a lot more insight into what it is. What happens if you grab all this open source and you put it into your product, right? You would have to go and certify every one of those components in order to get certified for your whole thing. Well, you need a systematic way of doing that. And just having the bill of materials, the list of items, instead of having security information or build information or install information, you could have safety functional certification information. So what I'm saying is that's exactly where we want to go, exactly what you just said. We want, it, at the end of the day, it's a list, right? You systematically want to go through that list and apply whatever task you want to perform on it. Functionally safe is a perfect example of that. Does that make sense? Thank okay. you. Okay. Hey, Mark. Uh, my name is Marcus. I'm actually from Revenera, who is one of their on your list. Mm -hmm. Um, you're talking a lot about packages and, and um, uh, versions. What about when you run into uh, code snippets? So, for instance, Stack Overflow or you know copied and pasted code. Are you cataloging that in a different manner, or do you? I'm just curious. Yeah. So that forensic that level. can be represented in the catalog, a snippet of code. Again, it could be a single file, it could be a collection of files, it could be a package. What we do is um, we borrowed from the SPDX world was the um, file verification code. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, where if you have like three or four files and you want to uniquely identify those files, um, you can then take the checksums of each of those files, put that into a new file, and then take the checksum of that, and you get a unique you know, uh, identifier. That is at the core of that catalog. You can uniquely identify something based on that. So if, if, if you wanted to have a snippet of code, like snippet, and I, and I would say down to, you know, I always think of it in files. If you have a set of lines, you always put those set of lines into a file. Right. So I'm not saying we're able to support very sophisticated snippet detection. That's for you guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. But if we have a snippet of code and someone wants to say, oh, we use Revenera's product, it found this problem, we can put that snippet into our database and then assign it a, a profile or, or um, you know, a record of information saying, oh, this snippet has whatever information you want to give it. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Not, I appreciate this, you guys hanging out on a very long day. Yes. Uh, thanks so much, it's a very good presentation, uh, quite practical. <laughs> I have a question about the s uh, yeah. I saw that you not only upload your notice file or source code uh, into your public portal, but also with these SPDX files as well. Um, when you use Black Duck, I suppose you use Black Duck to generate this as bone files. It will list all of this, not only open source, but also your IP and uh, also from supplier. So for each s bone or SPDX file, do you need to kind of do this triage by each team to remove some sensitive information or confirm with supplier, are they, do, do they like to be exposed by you? Mm -hmm. And okay. uh, from the legal aspects, SBOM or SP file, SPDX file is not hardly required to be published yet, right? You can keep it internally, but according it's to It's not a requirement to publish it, that's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I understand your question is, we produce our, SPD, our SPDX files. Are we able to control whether we put some other additional files in there or not because they might be sensitive to some other organization? Yes, that, Okay. and uh, there's a lot of admin work if you 
handle each SPDX file which generated by the Black Duck, for example? Yeah. We don't rely on Black Duck for SPX data, okay? I will tell you, I'm gonna brag. We're so much better at producing it internally than Black Duck. I'm not trying to pick on Black Duck per se. They do SPDX light. They just give you the top, we give it, I showed you every single file. We do, we have our own internal generator of SPDX. I told you we were the first producer of SPDX for Linux, commercially given out. We've been generating SPDX on our own. So we don't rely on Black Duck. And I, I wouldn't recommend, if you care about file level, Black Duck doesn't do file level, as far as I can tell, okay? Now, your other question was, when we produce the SPDX, are we gonna be able to carefully not give out sensitive proprietary code of our third party commercial vendors, for example, right? When we produce our, um, we only give out open source. We never produce SPDX for, we, we have the ability to know this is a commercial piece we're not gonna produce the SPX for that. We'll never, we'll, we'll publish all the open source. We just give out all the open source. We don't even think about whether we have a requirement to give out the open source or not. We just give it out. Like for example, we know that GPL requires source code, right? But MIT does not, correct? But we just give it out. <laughs> like, it's just so much more effective or efficient just to give it all out, right? But it's only open source. We only give out the open source. We will not produce SPDX, and we can easily detect this is a proprietary piece of code we're not gonna put that into the SPX generation. Okay? So you'll uh, generate SPDX with your own proprietary tool? We do. Thank you. Yeah. Um, now, um, we're not in a position to open source that because there are other tools out there that do it already. So it's not like, you know, it's no secret for us. To, I'm just saying we've been doing, that was what we did from the beginning. That was one of the very first things I talked about, right? And we, we, were, we felt a real need to do that because we're in this I, IoT embedded space and the, there was a real demand for that kind of information for that particular industry. One last question mm -hmm. for your uh, flow. In the middle, it's called a communication bus. Yeah. Uh, is that kind of like the container or, I mean, the, the database for your enterprise SBOM okay. information? Okay, so if, if you're not familiar with a communication bus, it, it's a concept that you have to have a, real kind of engineering degree, or not, not saying, not even people, a lot of people with computer science people don't know what a bus is. It comes from the hardware world of a bus, but there's a software bus. We use Apache Pulsar. I'm gonna tell you right now, we implement that with Apache Pulsar. It's, it's a open source project that allows you to create this thing called a communication bus. And what you can do is announce things onto the bus, records of JSON records, information, and every, any microservice that cares about it can listen in and the ones that are interested in certain kinds of, create a channel. Think about you can create a channel and each microservice can listen to a channel. And we just publish the disclosure to the different channels. Black Duck application has its own channel. Um, uh, our internal manager has its own channel and we just publish it. It's just a technology we use, but it's a very effective technology for creating a, a loosely coupled system. It loosely couples them so that, that it's easy to add, pull in and uh, plug in and pull out. I don't know if that answers your question. If you want a more detailed answer, I can give it to you after. You have another question or? Okay, I think this gentleman over here. Yeah. So you mentioned that you publish these snippets of JSON onto your bus. So um, did you write the integration with Black Duck to respond to those events? and consume those events yourself? Yeah. Or does Black yeah. Dog inher inherently support it? So, uh, these, these tools have their own APIs, right. right? They have an API. So we wrote an adapter. Okay. The, the, the adapter listens to the bus for those messages that it cares about, disclosures, new disclosures, right? They'll listen to that bus. Oh, there's a new disclosure? Then the, the adapter program takes it, parses it out, right? Yeah. Says, oh, I'm gonna insert this, I'm gonna call the API calls to Black Duck. I'm gonna insert into that release, that's so all. So basically you wrote a generic event consumer that works across various... Well, uh, I would say we wrote systems. an adapter that okay. allows it to be plugged in. It could probably, if you had to write another adapter, it's probably gonna be very similar. similar. But each one has to write, you have to write an adapter for each one because they each have their own APIs. Right, right. okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. I know it's been a very long day.